Hello, hello, hello. My name is Joey. Um, this is the first time I am doing a read aloud video, and it is for the post capitalist desire Mark Fisher reading group on Discord, where each week we will be going through the um, intended content for Mark Fisher's final course, post capitalist desire, or I guess final module. Um, and I thought it would be uh, helpful to some if they had ex some of that content accessible via like an audio book form or just someone reading it. My plan was to um, do streaming for these readings, and I might still do that. Um, I just have to figure out, that, figure out how to stream. So for the time being, it is going to be pre-recorded. Um, first up on the reading list was um, a piece or a chapter from Gibson Graham um, from their book, A Post-Capitalist Politics, came out in 2006. Um, quick background, this is from Wikipedia, J.K. Gibson Graham is a pen name shared by feminist economic, economic <laughs> geographers Julie Graham and Katherine Gibson. So Gibson Graham, there you go. Um, and then we have chapter one, which is entitled Affects and Emotions for a Post-Capitalist Politics. Let's jump in and see if I can make it through. Okay, stances. Cultivating ourselves as thinkers of political and economic possibility has involved a, finding a stance that orients us in a spirit of hopefulness toward connections and openings. As academics schooled, in thinking traditions that privilege critique, explanation, and caution, coming to feel comfortable in this stance has not been easy. Some of the reactions to our work have impressed upon us that our disposition toward the world sets us apart from and at odds with many contemporary social analysts. As we have felt a way through the resistances to our projects, we have begun to tentatively identify structures of feeling that orient toward closure and brush with despair. It seems that what pushes back against our political imaginary and the techniques of thinking we employ are quite different stances toward theorizing and the world that, for many, stand in the way of a politics of post-capitalist possibility. What we mean by stance is both an emotional and an affective positioning of the self in relation to thought and thus to apprehending the world. Under the influence of rationalist traditions that have policed the mind-body culture-nature divides, thinking has been seen to operate in a register above and separate from untamed bodily sensation. Yet we have all experienced the intense interconnection between thought and feeling. One has only to recall the inspirations that arise in the shower the jubilant emotions that accompany discovery, or the pleasurable sensations that ripple through the body in the presence of a complex idea lucidly expressed. In conversations with Nietzsche, Spinoza, Deleuze, and others, contemporary theorists such as William Connolly and Brian Masumi draw our, our attention to the layered inter- and intracorporeality. That's Connolly, 2002, 65 of thinking and the autonomy of affect that pulls thinking beyond the steady control of intellectual governance. Their work suggests that paying heed to the body-brain processes that operate beyond representation and consciousness might give new impetus to political thought and action. For us, this means paying attention not only to the intellectual arguments offered in response to our politics, but to the visceral intensities and emotive narratives that accompany their expression. In this chapter, we identify some of the stances that push back at our political imaginary. Committed to fostering a politics of becoming, we are compelled to explore their intersubjective nature. We consider that we can do, we, we can do to shift these organized habits of feeling and judgment that are lodged in our nature, that are lodged in our shared culture of inquiry and thus in ourselves as much, in our, as, much as in our critics. Capitalism is not, parentheses, only what we are up against. Soon after completing the end of capitalism, we became actively engaged in rethinking economy. 
inventorying the many existing class processes and other economic practices that could be called non-capitalist or alternative, speaking and listening to other theorists and to, a, to local economic actors worldwide, and collaboratively, collaboratively and conversationally developing a less capitalocentric, more inclusive, more differentiated language of economy. Recognizing the inevitable perform performativity of language, we undertook action research projects with local officials and activists in Australia, the United States, and the Philippines, attempting to cultivate ourselves and others as novel economic subjects with new desires and visions of possibility. What we found puzzling and unnerving, though certainly familiar, were the reactions to this project and to our determination to represent capitalism as a set of economic practices scattered over a landscape rather than a systemic concentration of power. With popular and academic audiences, in reviews and written rebuttals, in conversations with colleagues and friends, we confronted the same challenges over and over again. These resistances spoke to us not only at the level of intellectual argument, they also stirred uncomfortable feelings of dismay, recognition, and doubt in our usually relatively robust joint persona. The assertions that capitalism really is the major force in contemporary life, that its dominance is not discursive object but a reality that can simply be thought away, that it has no outside and thus any so-called alternatives, are actually part of the neoliberal, patriarchal, corporate capitalist global order, were deeply familiar. This way of thinking was what we had been schooled in and were now militantly working against. It impressed itself on us as something that we once were attached to, stirring up memories of the allure of a theoretical system that powerfully organized the world and appeared to promise guidelines for transformative action. More destabilizing was the criticism that politically we were barking up the wrong tree, that while we might help a few people in, in a few communities, our interventions could not make a dent in corporate globalization, that working at the local level would, not, would only foster fragmentation, not the unity and solidarity needed to build a global organization able to meet global power on its own terrain. That stepping, in where, that stepping in where the state had withdrawn and trying to make the best of it was only enabling the state's abdic abdication, which should have been more just directly opposed. These well-rehearsed views of the traditional left had authority over us, reluctant as we were to dismiss or denigrate past working class victories with their specific strategies and tactics. Against these certainties, we felt quite tentative about the potential efficacy of the new interventions we were advocating. Last, there was the judgment that looking for alternatives was escapist and irresponsible. We were not dealing with the emergencies of our time, with the people who are starving out there. The projects we were involved in were risky and would attract the unwanted attention of the authorities, especially the IRS and the welfare bureaucracy. We were endangering the people we were trying to help. What is more, we were doing so in a way that furthered our own careers at the expense of the powerless. These implications tapped into feelings of guilt about the privilege and confidence that led us out into localities with a sense that we had something to offer. While we had thought that our project was up against the discursive dominance of capitalism, we found that we were up against a culture of thinking that had socialized us, as well as others, that made capitalism very difficult to sidestep or give up. Our familiar anti-capitalist milieu was one in which we could not help but hear even our own voices saying that our projects of non-capitalist construction weren't going to work, that, that this kind of thing hadn't worked in the past, that it was naive and utopian, already co-opted, off-target, too small, and weak in the face of manifest challenges. When we allowed these reactions to press heavily against us, we felt our political room to maneuver shrinking, almost as though paralysis were setting in. In these moments of immobilization, we recognized our own subjection, and that, that and that of the left, more generally, within potent configurations of habit and desire that were incapable of supporting, quote, experimentation with new possibilities of being and action, Connolly, 2002. We puzzled over the emotional, theoretical, and historical conditions of this incapacity. Was, what was all this all-knowingness about the world? Where did this disparaging sense of certainty come from, the view that anything new would not work? Why were experimental forays into building new economies, movements, and futures greeted with skepticism and suspicion? We found that we were not alone in our consternation and questioning. 
a growing number of contemporary thinkers have been drawing attention to the deep-seated negativity associated with an epistemological practice. And that's, quote, epistemological practice in quotes from Sedgwick. A, quote, structure of desire, and that's W. Brown, quote, habits of feelings and judgment, Connolly. So to repeat that sentence, just because of all the quotes, a growing number of contemporary thinkers have been drawing attention to the deep-seated negativity associated with epistemological practice, a structure of desire, habits of feeling and judgment, the reactive stance, quote Newman, of critical, radical, left-oriented thinkers and activists. They identify that what has come to be the accepted or correct, quote, political stance as one in which the emotional and affective dispositions of paranoia, melancholia, and moralism intermingle and self-reinforce. Eve Sedgwick argues that the embracing reductiveness and confident finality associated with the practice of theorizing is a form of paranoia. As a psychic dis disposition of the intellect, paranoia wants to know everything in, adva in advance to protect itself against surprises. That's a cool quote. I like that. I'm going to repeat it. As a psychic disposition of the intellect, paranoia wants to know everything in advance to protect itself against surprises. That resonates quite a bit. It attempts to show intricately and at great length how everything adds up, how it all means the same thing. Paranoia extends the terrain of the predictable, casting its hypervigilant gaze over the entire world, marshalling every sight and in, in event into the same fearful order. Bruno Latour likens the thinking moves of contemporary theory to the beliefs of popular conspiracy theorists. Hmm. In both, and this is a quote from Latour, in both cases, you have to learn to become suspicious of everything people say, because of course we all know that they live in the thralls of a complete lucio of their real motives. Then, after the disbelief has struck and an explanation is requested for what is really going on, in both cases, it, again, it is the same appeal to power, powerful agents, hidden in the dark, acting always consistently, continuously, relentlessly. Of course, we in the, we in the academy like to use more elevated causes, society, discourse, knowledge slash power, fields of forces, empires, capitalism, while conspiracists like to portray a miserable bunch of greedy people with dark intents. But I find something troublingly similar in the structure of explanation. In the first movement of disbelief, and then, in the wheeling of causal explanations coming out of the deep dark below. And that's Latour from 2004. So, According to Sedgwick, the, the suspicious paranoid stance produces a particular kind of theory, quote, strong theory, with an embracing reach and a reduced, clarified field of meaning. In contemporary, in contemporary left political analysis, the narrative of neoliberalism as global capitalism's consolidating regulative regime exemplifies strong theory at the cutting edge. Most theories of neoliberal rationality assume a certainty and a sufficiency that blinds us to the potential failures of faltering movements of this new governmental technology. To the eye open to the emergent practices that are in placing neoliberalism, attempts to mobilize other economic rationalities that might foster non-capitalist practices are easily dismissed. Strong theory definitively establishes what is, but pays no heed to what it does. While it affords the pleasures of recognition, of capture, of intellectually subduing the, that one last thing, it offers no relief or exit to a place beyond. If we want to cultivate new habits of thinking for post-capitalist politics, it seems that there is work to be done to loosen the structure of feeling that cannot live with uncertainty or move beyond hopelessness. Another stance that undermines efforts toward imagining and enacting non-capitalist futures is what Walter Benjamin called left melancholia, in which attachment to a past political analysis or identity is stronger than the interest in present possibilities for mobilization, alliance, or transformation. 